as a journalist, um, my interest has been for many years um, financial globalization. Um, not as many years as Jim has been interested in this issue, but um, for quite some time. Um, and I have been a sort of combination of a journalist as a, and a campaigner. Um, having, uh, I started out looking at oil and politics in West Africa, and then I had a very uh, a, a sort of sudden illumination with a conversation with a couple of people about tax havens um, back in 2006, 2007, and made a sudden career pivot to, to tax havens. And I became very much an activist because looking at tax havens, I don't think you can be anything other than a tax haven, uh, other than an activist. So um, my two main books are Treasure Islands, which is about tax havens, uh, which I wrote about 10 years ago, and the much more recent Finance Curse. And just to give a, a very quick um, description of the, uh, of the difference between these two tax havens are countries with financial centers or financial sectors that transmit harm outwards to other countries or other jurisdictions. Um, you can have jurisdictions within a country, you can have states, you know, Delaware is known inside the United States as a tax haven in, in various dimensions. So tax haven transmits harm outwards to other countries. The finance curse thesis is kind of a complement to that. It's saying that countries with oversized financial centers transmit harm inwards to the country that hosts them. Um, we all need finance. We all need a certain um, you know, set of services and functions. But once the financial sector grows too big and starts developing in the wrong ways, and um, we had a question about hedge funds and private equity, that would be uh, one set of examples of finance growing in the wrong ways it starts to hurt the country that, that, um, that hosts it. And that comes out in terms of economic growth and um, democracy and you know, pretty much inequality, any, any dimension that, people, uh, that affects people's real, real lives. Oversized finance um, can be a curse. So I have been watching the, what you might call the new antitrust movement in the United States. It kind of, um, I date the beginning of it uh, to uh, about 10 years ago when Barry Lynn wrote a book called Cornered, which is now, even though it's, it's quite out of date, it's a really good sort of overview of the problem of monopoly, um, very heavily focused on the United States. And basically what was happening here was a new story. He was laying out a new story kind of for the first time. It was reaching back into American history, talking about um, uh, how there had been historically episodes of very powerful anti-monopoly when um, private power was regulated in the ways that Zephyr Teachout was talking about um, and government was, was looking after the interests of people, of its people. And then sometime in the, United, in the 1970s, a group of people um, in Chicago, um, led by, the, by Robert Bork, the jurist, came up with this new idea. And the new idea was that we should stop worrying about democracy. We should stop worrying about um, uh, uh, power. We should stop worrying really about the structure of markets and we should boil everything down, narrow, narrow everything down to consumer prices. And as long as consumers are happy, everything's great. And uh, we should also focus on the internal efficiency of corporations. If corporations are efficient, then they're going to spread their wealth around and everything will be fine. So don't worry about these other, other, other issues. This story that was, a, you know, one of the components of what many people call neoliberalism spread rapidly. It was obviously very well funded and it, um, uh, it became the dominant narrative in um, antitrust, anti-monopoly, and it allowed, effectively allowed for the massive consolidation that we've seen since then. Um, private equity firms, again, a bit of a bugbear of mine, were among the drivers of this consolidation, buying up firms all over the place and bolting them all together, but many other drivers of, of consolidation. And there was effectively a falling away of the state. The state decided to stand back, and this was both under Republicans and Democrats, all the way up to the Trump administration. Um, and so you had this, this, this story that 
once you start picking at it, it's so obviously incoherent, so obviously wrong, but power was with it and it carried, carried um, it, it survived and flourished across the world, spread across the world, spread to Europe, spread to other countries, to Australia, to Asia, to, to lower income countries, that consumer, consumer price is what it's all about. And um, so we have the giants of today and there's pretty much no government anywhere has been effectively cracking down until very recently. So the new movement came along with this new story saying, we need to start thinking about power again. We need to start thinking about democracy. We need to start thinking about uh, the structure of markets and we need to start taking down these giants and regulating with confidence again in the interests of people. So that's the, that's the kind of new story. It's a very glib summary of it. Um, it spread very, very rapidly in the United States. Um, and I wrote this article, this slide here, called If Tax Havens Scare You, Monopolies Should Too, and vice versa. So I was very much wearing a tax haven cap. I'm going to take this these headphones off, actually, because now that I'm um, speaking, it's going to be more comfortable for me. Can you still hear me OK? Yes, we can. OK. So if tax havens scare you, monopolies should too. And this, and this is all about corporate power. And it was looking at the very, the sort of intersection between um, the tax haven agenda, the anti-tax haven agenda that I had been very much a part of campaigning against tax havens and looking at the very, lots of similarities with the, with the new anti-monopoly story. And I, I actually should put a link up here. I can put it in the chat of, of that article. It's a very long article laying out the intersection if anybody's interested in it. Um, but the main point here is that when we started campaigning about tax havens, um, you know, I joined in uh, 2006, 2007, we saw this story catching fire right at the beginning. Nobody was really interested in it. Tax havens were a kind of exotic sideshow to the world economy. And literally the week I joined the Tax Justice Network, the campaigning group, um, the economist ran a cover story saying tax havens are wonderful and they help the flow of um, information of, of capital around the economy and they're efficient, blah, blah, blah. Um, and nobody was really questioning them. And we, we watched, we had a new story to tell. Um, uh, Treasure Islands was part of it, but there were, you know, other, uh, you know, other very important people, including Jim, who, who were telling the story. We put it all together, we packaged it up and we managed to start persuading, you know, going after different constituencies saying, look, you've got to pay attention to this. And you could see the lights going on in people's heads. Um, one after another, and um, particularly in Europe, but, but much further afield as well. There has been a real kind of awakening. You can sense it's a tangible sort of growth of a movement. So we watched this happening. When I saw this, when I started observing the sort of new antitrust in the United States, probably about five years ago is when I really sort of picked up on it. Um, I saw the same thing happening. There's a movement developing in the United States. Um, and... Um, so I wrote this as a kind of think piece, really just to get my ideas in order, and I published it. And um, a little while later, Barry Lynn, who is the, who I'd been in touch with, who's the sort of, you know, some call the godfather of the US antitrust movement, he, well, I sent it to him, and then he was contacted by a competition lawyer in the UK, Michelle Ma, um, who read that article. And she wrote me an email saying, I'm patiently got to get in touch with you because this is exactly what you know I've been trying to do. And she'd been trying to set up an anti-monopoly group um, in the UK. Now we'd both noticed that there's nothing, there was nothing outside. We couldn't see anything outside the United States, no movement of any kind, um, a sort of generalized complacency, a lot of interest in tax havens, which is as it should be, but no real interest in corporate power, just a sort of complacency that, you know, European competition authorities are doing a great job. Um, uh, there's not really a problem over here. It's an American problem. Um, and really everybody's still asleep. And I think we're still very much in that position. But we think that there is the potential now for this new story that emerged in the United States and has been incredibly influential. Um, Lena Khan is another person who Zephyr Teachout mentioned um, is one of the leading lights of it and about to be appointed to, to a, a top post. Um, so we want to bring that to basically anywhere outside the United, United States. I mean, we're the three of us um, who are the founders, Michelle and John Christensen, who's the main founder of the Tax Justice Network, um, we have started the process of setting up a new anti-monopoly movement in Europe. And 
we know that, you know, we can feel, you know, so we basically spend a lot of time talking to loads and loads of different people, and there is enormous demand for this. There are lots of people working against corporate power in different silos in different ways, but none of them have brought it together. None of them have really been operating um, in, in with, with sort of antitrust, anti-monopoly hats on. So um, that's kind of what we're doing. We, we the, the US story does need to be adapted for different countries, obviously. Um, the main differences are um, there is more, I think there is more focus, um, there is more need for the focus in Europe, for example, which is a collection of lots of different countries jostling with each other. Um, we need to focus on this issue of competitive competitiveness, which I'll get into, um, the race to the bottom between jurisdictions, some countries trying to be tax havens, um, uh, again, which I'll, which I'll get into. Um, we think there's a that the US antitrust movement hasn't yet really properly got to grips with the issue of international supply chains in a very coherent way. That's a very big area. If anybody's interested, this is a fantastically rich area, by the way. If anybody's interested in in studying this, you can spend the rest of your life um, studying this stuff. Um, and so, but this is so we we think there's a scope for a whole new, I mean, you know, there've been kind of anti-globalization movements and, you know, uh, for, for some time going on and, and trade justice people, but I think none of them have really taken on this sort of antitrust corporate power agenda. So we want to start um, organizing in that respect. We think this is a story that can reach right across the political spectrum. It's kind of easier to interest people on the left it's a softer sell but we're talking to some people you know a conservative party in the uk for example there's great interest in this um but there's uh because this is about the corruption of markets really and this is about um it just uh you know markets not working as they should so an another difference over here is that we are um, we think Europeans are generally more comfortable with tax than Americans are. I think that's changing in the States, obviously, and there's uh, I've got a couple of things to say about um, the Biden administration that's looking, you know, so quite positive so far. The other thing which we probably, I, I, there's been quite a bit of work done this in, in, on this in the US among the US new antitrust movement, but I think we want to really deepen it is this focus on financialization and the links with monopolization. And we can chat about that. I haven't put anything on, on this in the slides, but um, I've got various, um, you know, we, we can discuss if you've got questions about that because there's, this is another whole rich agenda, um, uh, how financialization intersects with interacts with monopolization. Um, you could say that monopolization is an aspect of financialization, depends how you want to define it. Um, so <clears throat> I want to focus um, really today more on this idea of competitiveness because it is such a big deal over here. In the UK, they're always talking about it, either um, overtly saying we must have a competitive financial center, we must have a competitive tax system, or covertly with little phrases like we want to be open for business. Um, the idea is... Um, there's this ocean of glow of capital roaming the globe, roaming the globe, and it's kind of rootless. And we want to attract this capital. We want to be competitive in that that respect. Um, it's competitiveness sounds wonderful, but it is a a complete dog's breakfast of incoherence and fallacies and woolly thinking. Um, so I'm talking about this race race to the bottom. A kind of competitiveness. Um, and it, what does competitiveness mean? What is this national competitiveness idea or, or you know, local competitiveness? You know, how, how, what does it mean for Delaware to be competitive with California or whatever? Um, and there is a lot of woolly thinking and we are gonna have, we're gonna come up with a, um, an edition of our newsletter soon that will unpack exactly this. What is the difference between so-called national competitiveness, market competition, and competition policy, which is what we call it here. Um, you could call it anti-monopoly, um, antitrust in particular. Um, and these things, these three words sound very similar. These three terms sound very similar, but they're actually completely different things. They interact with each other. And there is, uh, in people's minds, there's a sort of 
woolly conflation of all these different ideas um, as if they're the sort of same thing. And people think, well, competition is good, right? So competition be between countries must be good. So um, in fact, it is, it is complete nonsense. So this kind of, in terms of national competitiveness, and this could be the competitiveness that people talk about, uh, you know, our country must be competitive economically, or our tax system must be competitive, or our financial regulatory system must be um, competitive. Um, there's kind of two main versions of it. One is what I call the downgrading version. Um, and this is about, you know, cutting corporate taxes, um, worse financial secrecy, more tax loopholes, worse conditions for workers, you know, lax enforcement of, of money laundering laws or of, uh, you know, any other policies that give that make it hard for the owners of capital. Um, and the aim is you give, you kind of kowtow, it's a sort of, um, you know, bowing down to international capital, um, giving it what it wants. The aim is to attract it, come here and we'll give you an easy ride kind of thing. Um, and this, in that, this creates a sort of race to the bottom. You have, um, you know, one country puts in place one secrecy law, other countries say, well, they've got this, we can do something even better. And they put an even de more devious, deeper secrecy law or a tax loophole or whatever. And you get this constant kind of jostling between countries in a race to the bottom. Um, and the winners in this race are always um, the owners of capital, the owners of rootless um, capital, um, big multinational corporations, um, criminalizers, monopolizers, whatever. Um, so this, you know, this competitiveness sounds great, but this version of competitiveness is always harmful because it always takes money away from the losers who are the workers, ordinary taxpayers, small businesses who can't, you know, shift all their affairs offshore. Um, it shifts money from the losers to the winners. And so this version of competitiveness is a very harmful thing. And it, you can, of course, have competitive competition or antitrust policy. Competitive competition policy is um, kind of a contradiction in terms because it means that you're going to give capital an easy ride. You're going to allow it to do whatever mergers it likes. You're going to allow it to Rip its user, rip users' data out. Um, uh, have no concern for privacy. Um, lax enforcement of the laws and so on. Um, this is how you have competitive competition policy. So it just kind of illustrates the, the inco incoherence of this whole area. Um, and we recently had a review in the UK called the Penrose Review, which has basically taken this downgrading competitiveness agenda, saying we've got to have this kind of competition policy, um, and it's riddled with inconsistencies and. Um, but it's also very, very dangerous. But here at the very bottom, I just say here, you know, this kind of illustrates the incoherence of the whole approach. You boost competitiveness, this thing called competitiveness, by reducing competition, which sounds ridiculous because it is ridiculous. Um, to go to the sort of other pole um, of competitiveness, a much better version that some people talk about is what you might call upgrading instead of downgrading. And so you, um, you know, Maybe the government invests in good things, in you know roads and teachers and schools, hospitals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, gives workers strong protections, um, good health care, the rule of law, strong courts. Um, you could have progressive tax policies. Um, all these kinds of things you might call upgrading. Um, but the the key thing here is that a lot of people don't understand is that this version what you need to do here you're not doing it because you're trying to out compete some other country you're not investing in your roads because you want to you know we i actually i'm british but i live i live in germany you know you're not investing in roads here because you want to get one over on the french at all you're doing it because just for your own the benefit of your own citizens and relative what's happening relative to other countries is not what you're looking at um, and there's i put in krugman here there's a there's a one of the sort of classic articles about this, or I think from 1994, he wrote competitiveness is a competitiveness, a dangerous obsession. If you're looking for an interesting historical reference on this, this is the sort of classic. Um, so what gets called competitiveness in the good, good sense isn't really competitiveness at all because you're not competing with anybody. So the only kind of stuff that really might be called reasonably be called competitiveness is the downgrading version which is the bad stuff so in my book competitiveness the competitiveness of nature of com of countries jurisdictions as opposed to the competitiveness of companies um the competitiveness of countries is always a bad thing 
Um, there has been this, you know, under the Trump administration, I think there was the kind of, you know, the downgrading version was fairly um, to the fore, but also going back into in, in time, you know, the, the, the third way of Bill Clinton and Tony Blair was very much about this um, downgrading version of competitiveness, this kowtowing to global capital. But now we've got some nice statements coming out um, on tax. I, you can see this here from Janet Yellen, by choosing to compete on taxes, we've neglected to compete on the skill of our workers and the strength of our infrastructure. It's a self-defeating competition and neither President Biden nor I are interested in participating it, in participating it in it anymore. Um, this is a, a wonderful statement um, and I would agree with it. Um, we are, you know, early days. We'll see how we go with it. There's some um, interesting corporate tax reforms coming out. We are also seeing in the United States, the influence of the new antitrust movement. Um, it has, I mean, here is, uh, we've just published a newsletter from Tommaso Valetti, who's the former chief economist for competition of the European Commission. Um, and he, I think he put, puts his finger on it when he says that in terms of uh, enforcement, but also competition policies um, in the United States, we, we've seen a real sea change in, you know, the story has now become embedded. People want change. There is real pressure for change. The administration appoint, appointing people who look like people for change. We're at that point. Um, how far will it go? What, what will you know? Let's see. Let's see if this actually becomes something and really starts taking down um, these giant monopolies. And um, this is this is. I mean, I think it's it's always easy to say we're at a real crossroads because any I think any moment in history you could say we're at a crossroads for one reason or another. But I think this is this really is um, uh, quite a quite a hinge moment that we're we're on. Um, so that, that's the big question. That's kind of where I'm going to leave it now. Um, I think there is the potential outside the United States to build um, a amazing movement, amazing, amazing alliances across all sorts of different groups and getting from them to focus on corporate power and on the tools, particularly the antitrust tools, but the, also the broader anti-monopoly tools that include you know, labor laws and, and so many other um, tools and focusing on how to use these tools to get our democracies back. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. It's a, um, it, it, it's, it's a rather personal presentation because it's, um, it looks a bit at my, you know, what I'm up to, but I think these, I think we are, um, I, I think it, it, what's happening internationally will be very important for what's, what happens in, in the United States. We're a long way behind the curve, but I think, I think now we should start seeing um, things changing. So we've just start, we, we, we've set up this project called the Balanced Economy Project. We're in, this, in the process of forming the entity that will be the ba Balanced Economy pro pro Project. It will be um, up and running in the next few weeks. We have got a newsletter, which is called the Counterbalance um, on Substack. So if you're interested in looking at um, things outside the United States, um, this is somewhere that you will be able to find out information. So that's the end of my presentation. I guess we can move on to discussion. I hope we can talk about um, private equity as well, because um, I that, that question. I we already have a question from Harrison. Um, I would love to just uh, I mean, say that this is brilliant as usual. Um, uh, you know, there is a lot. I think I'd love to hear from you about what we learn from the history of the tax justice movement and its successes and failures and so forth about uh, building this movement um, and also some of the research questions uh, that you think might be empirical questions because a lot of the effort in the uh, tax justice world I'm familiar with uh, benefited from empirical measurement of some of these problems. So those are my two issues. But Harrison, um, can you jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much for speaking to us so 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 late at night. Um, I, I well, I can talk to private equity. I wanted to talk about a couple of things or, or ask a couple of questions. First, with regard to the work you're doing in in Europe and 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 as it pertains to the US, like there's a uh, there's a book called The Brussels Effect, which talks about the um, the soft power that Brussels has in terms of regulation to enforce that 
just by enforcing it across Europe, it sort of by de, de facto enforces it globally because everyone has to follow this sort of like higher line. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how that might apply to sort of competition policy, either in Europe or in the US, whether like the US can take a sort of leading role in, in, in making this change globally just by making a domestic change. Um, so that's, that's the first question. And the second is on the venture capital side, having, having worked in venture capital and, and, and I think, um, I don't know if David's still on the call, but David, in terms of building, in building companies, venture capital firms, and, and there seems to be a structural problem in venture capital and private equity industry in terms of investing and looking for the winner in the space and everyone talks about who is going to win in this in this industry in this space and and that is in, obviously inherently problematic when it comes to monopolies um so so i sort of am struggling with this idea of regulating monopolies like when they become monopolies uh it, it feels like we have more of a structural issue that could be addressed sort of at source and i was wondering if you had any thoughts about that in terms of like what we could do on like a whole industry level rather than like allowing these companies to get so big and then breaking them up and sort of that seems like a bit of a backwards approach yeah um oh two very good questions i i'm i well there may have been more questions there. my screen froze for 60 seconds in the middle of it so um i the two questions i got were about um uh, the brussels effect and then the venture capital looking for the winner um, was there anything else that i missed there no, that's, that'd be great. That's great. Right. Okay. So on the Brussels effect, um, yeah, sure. Soft power of the EU. I, I think there is a misconception um, in the United States, but also it, I, I think it is across the Atlantic, both in the United States and the, in the EU, that the EU doesn't have, that the EU competition policy is pretty good. I mean, you do see stories about, you know, Margaret Vestager, the, the EU competition commis commissioner, slapping Google and co with with heavy fines for for all their abuses. Um, that is true, I think, in terms of, I think it, the United States has been so lax for so many years that anything that Europe does looks good. Having said that, the record in Europe is appalling. Um, there was a book by that there is a book by Thomas Philippon, and I've forgotten the title of it, sorry, um, the great something um, maybe somebody knows it um he's looking at monopoly and he's using europe as a kind of example to show america how bad it is in terms of monopoly and it, it, it's not a bad you know it's, it's not a bad book um but he's wrong to hold europe up as an example um just for example i was looking the other day at the merger statistics um the europe that you know there's a system of i think they get about fifteen thousand mergers a year um in europe and of those, maybe I think three or four hundred get notified, you know, here's a merger, it's, it's potentially going to cause competition concerns, you guys are going to have to look at it. If you look at the record of the mergers that are notified, which are mergers of, of potential concern, um, since 1990, 0.4% of those have been prohibited. Um, almost nothing. They just don't block mergers. Um, so that's a sign that there's serious trouble. Um, anybody who looks around in Europe will know that we have a problem with big pharma, with big agriculture, with big retail, with big tech, with the big four accounting firms, with big banks. Um, we've got the same problems. We have social democracy here in Europe that um, takes off some of the hardest edges of these things, but I think that Whereas social democracy in Europe has been quite effective in certain areas, such as tax policy, um, in terms of monopolies and, and um, excessive concentrations of power, I think Europe has basically drunk the Kool-Aid. The fines that you see, several billion dollars um, on the, the tech giants, look big. Um, you know, once you have the number of billion in there, it makes a great newspaper head headline. But again, it's almost a rounding error in the actual size of the, the profits that these companies are making. So Europe does not have, Europe is especially weak in this area. Um, um, its social democracy has not really engaged with this. It has drunk the Kool-Aid from Chicago 
Um, if you look at, you know, it's a very nuanced picture, of course. There are things positive things, things you can say about Europe, but um, Europe is not in a position to spread at the moment, spread a beneficial Brussels effect around the world in this in this area. Um, so yeah, I think the answer to your question is we are going to look to the United States for leadership at this point. It, we hope, you know, me and my friends who we're working with hope to spread this new story. And over time, this is something that takes years to do to shift things in Europe so that Europeans wake up and start to do. And I think Europeans are quite capable of waking up and doing things differently. I think there's a lot of questioning going on um, here. I just know, I heard today that the um, new leader of the Green Party in Germany, um, the Green Party used to be, you know, a bunch of kind of radicals, um, is now, uh, has now um, catapulted the Greens to the party with the biggest number of them um, in the polling. It's up at like nearly 30% above the CDU, which is the Angela Merkel's party, and well above the SPD, the, the, the supposedly socialist party. Um, so things are really changing. There's a lot of um, room for, for moving. But uh, right now, I don't think there's we can look to a Brussels effect um, really of any, any significance um, that will help the United States or help other countries. I think it will come, but we're, we're some way to go. So, um, you know, once again, we're looking to the Americans for leadership in this area. Um, Sorry. So uh, what, you, you know, Churchill's remark about uh, the Americans will eventually do the right thing after they have exhausted all other possibilities. Yeah. So that's yeah. maybe what we're up to. Uh, I mean, it doesn't help that we have the largest tech companies uh, here and, uh, you know, not in Europe. But uh, David Leighton, you had a follow up question to. Uh, I did. I just wanted to respond quickly to Harrison and then say something else about the uh, monopoly issue. So, I mean, Harrison, on your point, I, I strongly agree. I think that the, the venture capital business is supposed to play, you know, two roles, right? They're supposed to be the engine of entrepreneurship and innovation. On the one hand, they're supposed to be generating returns for their investors on the other hand. But the, the profit motive, I think, is guiding them in, in some ugly directions. Uh, I, two easy observations to make. The first one being that they're biased toward these network effect businesses that get very dominant very quickly. And, you know, like you pointed out, end up in the uh, uh, sphere of companies like Amazon. The second one being that basically, you know, there's this valley of death where the things that would be the most socially valuable don't ever get financed because they would take too long, right? And the more sophisticated our technology gets, the more uh, money it would take to create something truly great, like a cure for cancer. So like, I, I, I totally agree, but I wanted to uh, pose a, a question back to, to Nick on, on all of this stuff. I mean, uh, I, I totally accept that the antitrust and like anti-monopoly movement needs to come forward. How do you see the uh, question of the technologies themselves behind these big monopolies like Facebook uh, and how nefarious they may be, you know, on their own at whatever scale. How do you see that playing into the conversation with, with public policy and, and regulators in like an appropriate way? Because, you know, from my perspective, it doesn't seem like the Americans are gonna have much of a leadership role in this at all, right? I mean, I think our regulators can barely understand what the hell Facebook actually does. And on the contrary, GDPR seems like a much more reasonable attempt at protecting people's privacy. So I wanted to know if you thought that Europeans might play any kind of a leadership role in, you know, pointing to just how, how bad some of the practices of Facebook are, whether that's not being serious enough with our data or whether it's getting a, us addicted to our cell phones or social media or, you know, spreading disinformation and all the other bad things that they get up to. Okay, well, uh, that's an um, enormous question. I want to go back to the venture capital question because I, I, I didn't address it. Um, I also want to, I, mean, I, I agree with what you said. Um, uh, you know, we have these same valleys of death over here. One thing I would make clear is make a distinction between venture capital and private equity, I and mean, there's a lot of similarities, but and a lot of overlap, but um, private equity, the core business model really is, to, is not to, go for startups and you know here's an exciting new idea some people tinkering around in their shed and let's build a brilliant global company 
private equity is uh, the, the, the main approach is to scan the economy for companies that are doing well, that have got good cash flow. Let's go in. Those companies aren't financially engineered enough. Let's go in, buy them up, and financially engineer them using debt um, to extract as much wealth as possible. I and mean, that's, you know, there's a mixture of things that private, private equity firms do. There's plenty of good stuff they do. But the way I see it is that the good stuff that they do, um, you know, putting in better management or whatever, is stuff that any company would do. It's the things that make private equity different from other companies, from other um, business models. The things that distinguish them are nearly always the harmful thing. They are the financial engineering things. Um, and just to give a um, uh, an example of a private equity technique, and you will find this, you know, that you, you find this in the care sector. You know, someone caring for your aged grandparents is um, they will have no idea who really owns the company of the that owns the building that they're working in. But the, 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 the core trick is, it's the old other people's money trick where you get um, other people to put money in, you, the private equity mogul, take all the fees from doing it. You, you build up this fund with money from outside investors. Typically the, the, the general partners, the sort of the owners and controllers of these private equity funds put in 2% of the money in the funds and the outside investors that might be your pension fund or sovereign wealth funds or whatever, put in 98%. So they're not putting very much of their money at, at risk um, to start with. They, they, they get this pot of money, go and buy a company. Maybe it's making shoes or, or, or you know, chess pieces or something like that, and uh, or television programs. They buy this company and then they load that company up with debt. Their, special, their expertise generally is in debt markets and in um, getting, you know, being very clever with borrowing and they create these very clever corporate structures that enable them to maximize the borrowing. But the key innovation is that debt is not on their shoulders, it's on the shoulders of the company. So, uh, you know, one trick is known as dividend recapitalization and it's so, it, it's kind of shocking. Um, it, you know, when you look at you to look at it, this can't be legal, but it but it is, and it happens quite often in private equity land. You will you will have debt placed on the shoulders of this company that they just bought. So that company now is much more indebted. The proceeds of that borrowing that that company has borrowed are then funneled up to the private equity investors, and those investors. Um, are then able to spend it on you know yachts or jets or whatever they want um and so they're not investing that money they borrow the money they're not investing into the company they're just taking it for themselves and the company has to pay back the debt and there's a kind of separation between the company and the uh the company and the that the they've acquired and the, the moguls the titans who, who who control the ship so there's no accountability there's no responsibility they just you know if that company goes bankrupt well you know they haven't really lost anything. And if it does well, then they make a killing. So it's a complete separation of, of, of responsibility and, and uh, abdication of responsibility on their part. And because of it, it's, it's kind of like a coin flip where if you, you know, heads, you lose, you win nothing, you lose nothing. Tails, you win a lot. Um, what are you going to do with, if you're faced with those incentives? If, if you're able to do that, it's just flip as many coins as possible, you know, buy as many companies as you can. And um, that, you see that happening all the time. So they just scan it, scan the economy, looking for good companies that can financially engineer, do these coin flips. Um, sometimes they make huge amounts of money. Sometimes they don't, don't make very much, but they almost never lose anything. And uh, it's just a trick. It's just like a conjuring trick. And so you can see there that, you know, the incentive to buy is not buy, is buy, buy, buy. And, and often they put companies in the same sector together so they can build monopolistic power, market power. Um, and this this sort of stuff is uh, is you know it's part of the finance curse, but it's also part of this monopolization um, game that uh, that is you know central to what we're talking about. The question about big tech and conversation with regulators. Do you know what I'm going to actually duck that question? because um, in this movement, um, I'm not really the big tech guru. I could probably waffle on um, about big tech, but I'm not yet um, confident enough to say anything very 
very um, good about it. I mean, you could, I, I think Zephyr Teachout's book will be very good on that. Barry Lynn has got a new book out called Liberty from All Masters, which um, goes into great detail into these things, um, into public utility regulation and, and things like that. Um, so there's, there's quite a few books out there on this, but I, I would probably start there. So I'm sorry to duck that question, but I'm, I will. Other questions from students? Let me um, encourage anyone. I can ask a follow up question. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, I, I, well, this is not really a follow up question, honestly. Um, one, one of the things we haven't touched on in terms of monopolies and, and it's less about big tech and more about the, the legal side of things. Um, traditionally, sort of uh, the high risk or like um, valley of death if innovations or research that David was talking about were done by universities right now. And, and broadly sort of still are, but some of these really big technology firms are doing some, you know, frankly, pretty impressive or scary sort of depending on the way you look at it, work in uh, technology sort of like AI or, or, or um, with Google in terms of like bio, in, in, in uh, AlphaFold, like biology and so on. Um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about like how that should be regulated, like in terms of breaking them up and, and where that, that side of their businesses sort of lie and whether that is, you know, you can ask questions about whether that's a good thing. Some of the stuff that they've been doing has been uh, at least potentially quite positive. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I can like move the conversation in that, that way or anything, um, or if that makes sense, but uh, we haven't touched on that. Okay, well, I'll have a go. I mean, one of the interesting ways to look at it um, is so, and this is kind of more of a general comment uh, about how these things can be done. Breakup is, you know, you have to have a fight with power, basically. And you have to, um, uh, you know, it's, we're not there yet politically, um, maybe getting there soon in the United States, certainly not there in Europe. Um, I think in many cases, breakup is absolutely necessary. Um, but, you know, as Zephyr Teacher has said, you know, it's part of a stable of anti-monopoly tools. But there's a, 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 another way of looking at it, which is kind of complementary to it, is um, reversing the burden of proof for mergers. So, um, you know, recently we had a, uh, the Google merger with Fitbit and the European Competition Authorities approved it. They were heavily criticized and rightly so for approving it. Um, they said it didn't have raised competition concerns. Of course it did. Um, you know, all these, all these um, tech giants are basically merging. They're looking at the sort of the, the, the thresholds. Uh, you know, they, they're looking to duck under the threshold, buying up companies that are just underneath the thresholds and they don't have any antitrust scrutiny. So Europe, um, I think the big tech firms, um, 90, 90, I, I saw the statistic that 97% of all of their acquisitions were not even investigated, were not notified, were not looked at. They just sailed through because they ducked just underneath the thresholds. Um, what you can do is for large firms, you can have uh, reversing the burden of proof for mergers. So if at the moment, if a company wants to buy another company or wants to merge with another company, a large company, either you just duck underneath the threshold or you go through a whole process with the European Commission, with the economists, and you have a whole kind of legal game that goes on. And you're having to, uh, you know, the, the, the authorities are always right on the back foot because they have to demonstrate that this is going to be harmful. To the competition. It's, this merger is going to go ahead unless they can demonstrate beyond all doubt that this is going to be harmful for competition. Of course, the companies are the ones with the, all, all the information. They don't share the information. Um, Tommaso Valletti, the chief competition economist, was describing how he would, you know, the, his opponents on the other side of the table would be recruiting top academics to rebut all of his arguments. Um, and he described one meeting where he was with um, you know, a, a sort of former colleague he knew very well, who was a very good economist, and he was asking, you know, about his his economic model and saying, well, what if you change this assumption and stuff like that? 
but he couldn't get an answer because there was a lawyer sitting next to him and the law firms are the gatekeepers and the lawyer was saying, don't answer that question. Um, so there's this complete asymmetry in information and the authorities are always on the back foot and they cannot stop these mergers because they cannot prove that this is going to be um, a, prob a problem. I mean, you know, th there are successes from time to time, but basically, but if you flip this around and you say, okay, we're going to start from the position that you are a giant company. We're not going to let you merge or buy um, these companies because, you know, bigness is power and it's corrupts democracy and so on. So we're going to block this, but we're going to let you show us that there's no other way, you know, you, this is going to deliver amazing efficiencies and there's no other way that you can do it other than this through this merger. So you Google, it seems, you know, so you, you, from the position of the competition authorities, you say, okay, you Google, you're one of the most powerful countries in the world, companies in the world. You are, um, you're telling us that you have to merge with Fitbit um, because you can bring all these wonderful efficiencies. Okay, maybe so, but you now have to prove to us that there's no way that you couldn't build these efficiencies yourself, you Google. We want to see you prove to us that Google just, you know, is just unable to, to, to deliver these wonderful things. So and the only way for you to, to deliver them and the only way that the world is going to get these benefits is if you buy Fitbit. And if you do that, you completely flip the burden of proof. You do allow an opt out and you do allow the possibility for efficiencies to emerge, but in general terms, you know, mergers, especially or involving large firms, have delivered payloads of harms to the economy, to society. Um, you know, they may deliver wonderful benefits to the merging companies. Um, often they don't as well. But um, if you reverse this burden of proof, then you you create a whole new paradigm. And over time, you will get competitors um, popping up and they will not, it will not be possible for the, you know, the, the, the classic tactic of a monopolist is when anything comes up that's looking good, they'll just buy it and get it out of the marketplace. So they remain- Nick, we have a, a question from Radion. Um, been... Yeah, thank you so much for speaking <clears throat> with us today. And my main concern regarding implementing this sort of refer reform, especially in the United States, is that often a lot of these cases end up in the judicial branch and the Supreme Court is forced to kind of issue decisions on, you know, these extremely complicated financial regulations. And as you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of influence from, you know, huge law corporations that kind of uh, battle against these reforms. So is there a way that you can imagine to kind of shift the procedural requirements to gain a, a you know, a larger grasp on these reforms and to limit the influence of the judicial branch? You mean, are you, are you worried about the, the, particularly the Supreme Court and the kind of rightward shift of it, you know, getting over that blockage? Is that, is that where you're coming from? Was that not quite the question? Well, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's even necessarily regarding ideology. I'm just concerned about having nine justices decide and interpret the, you know, financial regu yeah. regulations from the legislative branch. Yeah, well, it's true that, um, so there has been a, since the 1970s, a coordinated campaign to, to educate in inverted commas, um, judges, and uh, there have been various kind of think tanks, the Global Antitrust Institute and various others have been giving like five day courses to um, judges, lawyers, people, you know, anyone who's gonna be involved with the courts. And they've been giving them this Chicago Kool-Aid um, and it's been incredibly effective. So in terms of the actual legislation on the books in the United States, as I understand it, I mean, I'm not a great expert on the United States um, legal system, but you know, the, the old anti-monopoly laws, antitrust laws are still in place. They're still in force. Um, you know, the Sherman Act and Clayton Act and all these others, um, are still are still there, but they've been interpreted by the courts to allow bigness, to allow mergers, to allow corporations to become bigger. Um, so there is a question of enforcement and laxity of enforcement. And you also had, um, I think the central problem has been at the top. You know, you had, um, uh, you know, the Obama administration was incredibly close to Google and because they thought they could do well out of um, 
you know, Google could help them with their sort of election campaigns. But that was one hell of a deal with the, de with the devil. So you had, you know, the problems right at the very top, the whole ideology, the whole worldview of those administrations was um, steeped in bigness, steeped in the Chicago Kool-Aid. And all this, kind, you know, the, the sort of corruption we all know about, um, which, is, which still exists, but, but the, at least the ideology now has changed, has, is in the process of changing. And there is, there is a lot of um, new thinking coming out. Whether this is going to seep down into the judicial branch and the extent to which it is seeping down, I'm not sure. Um, there was an interesting post. If you're interested in looking at this, there is a blogger called Matt Stoller who follows these things in quite some detail. Um, he has a, a, a newsletter on Substack called Big. It's just called Big. He's S-T-O-L-L-E-R. And he looked at this in, I think, his last post. If you look at Big or the last post but one, and he looked at an interesting decision of Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court that seemed to be going against the previous kind of, um, the, the previous way that things, things were done. And so there is, you know, there is change happening there. I'm not the person to ask about the, you know, how the changes are playing out in the United States. Um, do look at, I mean, Matt Stoller's newsletter, Big, is really interesting, worth subscribing to if you're interested in these issues. Um, but I think there is movement there. So that's a slightly woolly answer, but um, gives Jonah, we have a, um, Jonah has a question. I have one question for you as well, which is, um, you know, we've heard uh, from our friends like George Gilder that this problem will basically solve itself. He has a book, writ, written a book called The End of Google. Um, is there anything to that kind of libertarian perspective that you think we should take seriously? Or is, is this a... Uh, that's always been the case. I mean, um, Robert Bork, who I mentioned earlier, who was a sort of, um, the sort of main instigator of the original Chicago School Antitrust, made yep. this argument at the beginning. It's just the sort of libertarian idea markets will you know, fix themselves. Um, he said, you know, any company that becomes dominant and starts making super profit, pro profits, well, the competitors will come in sky darkening swarms to, um, <laughs> to take their, to, you know, to, to get a piece of some of these profits and will just compete it out of existence. Monopolies cannot exist. They just cannot happen. You know, this was the sort of logic and you know, anybody who had a brain who knew how things worked at that time could see this was complete nonsense. But um, that's where the money wanted to go. That's where the, that's where the ideology wanted to go. And that's where, um, that's where generations of people across the political spectrum went, um, going with the big money and just sort of batting away these, these inconvenient truths. Right. So yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's, you know, they, we, we see, it's, it's like these arguments we see on tax havens. Tax havens are great because of blah, 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 blah. They're just, mm. you know, and there's always some argument behind them, some sort of rather complicated um, set of justifications. What, what are the empirical issues that we need to study here in terms of making progress um, that you would say, okay, here's some things we'd like to know in order to dramatize this issue? That's a very good question. I mean, one of the interesting, uh, one of the interesting areas where there is some research coming out, but again, this research is mostly focused on the United States, is on the question of monopsony power. Um, um, so monopoly is if you have a single seller, monopsony if you have a single buyer. Monopsy power in the, in the labor market. In other words, how much has monopoly contributed to pushing down workers' wa wages in the labor market? And um, trade unions have started waking up to this in the United States. Again, not so much anywhere else. It will be very interesting to push forward. So the measurements that I've seen are that since the, since the 1980s, um, the labor share of income around the world has fallen by about seven percentage points um, uh, of GDP. So that's effectively workers have been losing globally some i think it's seven or eight trillion dollars a year um, compared to what they were getting as a share of national income back in the 1980s um, it's there is some 
dis disagreement over the extent to which this is the result of rising market power um, or other factors such that such as you know information technology such as changing trade patterns um, there is still some work to be done untangling this but this seven trillion figure figure is you know workers on average i can't remember what how that broke down on a worldwide basis but i think on average workers would be getting you know two thousand dollars a year more each that's around the world in the united states it's more like you know ten thousand um, dollars a year each this kind of research i think a sort of doing this on a country by country basis how much are the workers in each country you know in this country losing out as a result of this change in the labor income is is very very useful um but also untangling how much of this is due to um the rise in monopoly power the rise in markups so i think this kind of area there's a lot of interest in work still to be done um i can uh you know give people pointers to a few studies that have been done but i think this is a, a very very rich terrain and this is the sort of terrain where you can really um you know get powerful allies um you know trade unions is one example um uh, of, of allies who who you can use this stuff to shake them by the scruff of the neck saying look at this you know you need to get engaged in this area um, jonah i'm thinking a question. Gonna, yeah jonah yeah so i was i was wondering um well actually i was thinking about how email and um, even the internet itself kind of started as sort of like american government projects and it grew from there and now they're decentralized uh, protocols so like no there's no one company that controls the internet or the email and so i was wondering if you think there's an opportunity to to build similar decentralized systems to undermine say like the big tech companies and sort of break up the monopolies that way well i think i mean i, I think that's a personally i may be wrong but i think that it feels a bit kind of utopian to me because i think you know it, the internet did start out like this and platform and network effects rapidly took over and sort of monopolies emerged kind of almost naturally and rapidly became so powerful that governments became cowed by them they were afraid of them um how you would uh, you know the classic monopolist trick as i said is to is to any competitive threat that emerges on the horizon you buy it um, or you crush it um, you know, Amazon has the power, as Zephyr Teachout said, to crush all sorts of players all across the economy. I mean, they're, you know, they are single-handedly responsible to, to, for a decent share of the destruction of our high streets. Um, so I think, I don't think, I don't see that as a, as, as a way forward, decentralized networks, um, new technologies making, taking their place because these players have eyes and ears everywhere. And particularly the big tech firms and they're not going to they're not going to go quietly and they know exactly how to stop this kind of stuff emerging unless there's some mechanism you know maybe there's some amazing idea out there technological idea out there but i don't think that you know people you know blockchain or any of these new kind of ideas or fintech or any of this it's it's as soon as it becomes um profitable it's going to be um, brought into the, it's either going to become a monopoly um, or when I say monopoly, I'm, I mean a firm with excessive concentration of power um, or it's going to be bought up by one of the, the giants. So I'm not that optimistic. Any sign that, what are other that China shares our perspective on your perspective on this, that they're being tough on their monopolies? Um, as... Yes, they do. They have been some some activism in china again um uh you know the the monopoly there is the chinese communist party that yes yeah, of course you know they've been very careful in controlling it all so it's a very different kind of picture but yeah. that's not to say there isn't oligarchy in in china there, there certainly is um and i think they i think they have a severe problems of vested interests but i think um, you know, the, they've been having a fight with Jack Ma recently, and I, again, it's not, it's not my area, so I, I can't really comment on it, but um, I think the Chinese are concerned about it, um, 
they can they understand um, that it is important not to allow the very keen for you know alternative centers of power not to emerge um, and so they've kept more of a lid on it than, than than we have but they use different kinds of tools there's a lot of interest in the u.s anti-monopoly community the new antitrust community about china mm. and about the ability of um because you know monopoly is power and if you are a foreign hostile actor if you are able to there's myriad choke points in your economy. If you're able to um, grasp one of these choke points, you can leverage your power in many, many ways. So there's there's quite a lot of interest in that. And you know, again, if that's an area of interest to national security, there's plenty of kind of seminars and stuff that go on that um, are interesting to attend. I'm yes, not, I'm, I'm, I'm you've got getting, to sign off now and you're getting tired. Let me just ask one more question because you were one of the principals in building this tax justice network, uh, which has made quite a bit of progress. Now, not perfect, but we're, you know, tax policy, tax justice is now on the international agenda. I guess, what are the lessons that we learned from that movement about building this movement? And how do we huh. make it, how do we make it um, saleable to, you know, the average American? who, you know, back when Standard Oil was charging higher prices for oil, he could understand the problems with monopoly. But, you know, today you're telling, you're saying, well, what is the, what is the penalty from having Google around or Facebook? They're providing me with free service. I mean, I'm, yeah. you know, are these the folks, how do we make the case to them, to the average voter um, that they should worry about, you know, the decline of newspapers or the fact that Facebook is manipulating advertising. I mean, how does how do you make that yeah. political case? Yeah, I mean that's a, a, another yeah, it's a, a big question. Um, lessons from the tax justice movement. Um, I mean, there are some things that aren't transferable. I mean, one of the things that happened was when the tax justice network began putting this new story out. Soon after that, we had the global financial crisis, and then we had the Panama Papers, both of which really reinforced this wave and created a sort of surge. Um, um, but this sort of, but it was a kind of internally coherent story that really did have sort of a, a small number of villains on one side and ordinary people on the other side. And um, it was, Particularly interesting because before, on an international scale, because before this analysis came along, we had um, uh, a kind of paternalistic view of foreign aid, for example. So, so or, or lower income countries. You know, we, we need to we need to give more aid to these countries. I think I'm maybe getting some family pressure coming. I'm I'm going to have to go quite soon. Yes, but. Um, because I, I fear I may be keeping them awake. Um, but anyway, it was this kind of like country versus country, you know, money flowing from rich countries down to poor countries in a kind of paternalistic way. So th there wasn't really great potential for building alliances in that, in that respect. It was kind of, you know, let's give more money to these people. The tax justice story was, um, here we have these global actors who are operating between countries mm -hmm. um, in ways that um, where the villains and it's not rich countries against poor countries so much. I mean, there's an element of that, of course, but the real battle is between ordinary people in poor countries and ordinary people in rich countries, ordinary people in all countries against these kind of transnational, this small nuts, this transnational set of elites. And that story enabled the construction of kind of lots of international alliances and again, an internally coherent sto story. So that was very, very effective. I think with the monopoly story, um, you definitely have the villains part of it. Um, you can show the harms. I think a lot of people instinctively understand some of the harms, um, the damage to democracy from big tech, of course, is very, um, palpable to many people. And it's a question of telling that story and working out how best to tell it. Um, the story of Amazon slaughtering small businesses all over, the, all over the place. I think that's a story that's fairly easy to get across to people. I think 
maybe it just hasn't been done enough yet but i think there is i you know i think that is going to rise and i think if we can harness voices from small businesses you can you know you can divide the republican party the conservatives in the uk because some want to be on the side of big businesses nobody wants to be against small businesses you can get a lot of mileage with that kind of thing and building all sorts of new alliances in, in that area one of the other tactics uh, strategies of the tax justice movement was to think in terms of constituencies um so at the very beginning when nobody was listening to any of this story about tax havens it was okay let's who's who's going to be most open to this agenda which constituencies well let's start with development ngos you know working on you know poverty and in those days there wasn't people didn't really talk about inequality they spoke about poverty in africa let's go to them and say look your country is being looted and all the money is being stashed in tax havens um and initially it was quite difficult because they were saying yeah we're kind of busy this is interesting but you know we're busy getting aid levels up but soon lights started going on in people's heads and they started waking up and then we could kind of leave them to get on with it and they started building all this kind of noise international noise about tax havens it was really good and we went on to you know next constituency trade unions by the way workers did you know that you know multinationals are dodging taxes and um, using tax havens, blah, blah, blah. And trade unions started getting interested and they started running with it. So with a kind of very small core of people, I and mean, at the beginning, um, it was basically John Christensen and me surrounded by, you know, a small number of experts, including you, Jim, um, just telling this story, going to different constituencies and just waking them up. So waking up each constituency one at a time. And I think there's a lot of scope for doing that with um, anti-monopoly work as well, because it touches everybody. And I think it's just a question of telling these stories in the right way. So we, we our plan, our little group is to, is to do this, is just to sort of wake up different constituencies, talk to lots of people, get them to run with it, let a thousand flowers bloom and kind of build up, um, build up a movement from there. But it's so we have a conviction in Minneapolis, uh, just for anyone who's watching that trial um, that just came over. But I wanted to thank you, Nicholas, for an outstanding, really stimulating presentation. Uh, and I'm sure that a lot of us will be thinking about how to get involved in helping uh, with this important new uh, movement that you are beginning to, uh, to, to work on. And uh, yeah, we're certainly a right at the beginning part. of it over here in Europe. But, um... Well, I think you know uh, yeah. it, there needs to be complementary actions over here uh, in the belly of the beast. But um, yeah, yeah. Thomas, do you want to say farewell? Well, I had wanted to ask a question, but I don't want to do it at the expense of Nick's family. So I'm. I can hear rumblings, and I'm afraid I'd probably I'll put my camera back on. Yeah. Um, I've moved a little further away. So well, ask the question and we can all discuss it. <laughs> children's pictures, I'm afraid. My question comes sort of from a little bit of a Marxist direction and it concerns uh -huh. the question of this power that great uh, economic concentrations of capital have. Right? One simple way of thinking about it is to say, this is just uh, getting a larger share of the gross national product or the world product so it's all about distribution, how the total uh, GNP gets distributed. Another way of looking at it would be to say that, and that comes in when you talk about Facebook, for example, these guys are shaping opinions. And so they have creative, almost governmental powers where they can take initiatives, they can uh, direct large capital flows in one direction <laughs> or the other. Uh, of course, they can in principle do that is what the first group would say, but uh, they will have to use their economic power always in a way to maximize their own economic power. Because if they don't act in maximizing ways, then they will be driven out by others. So roughly on the spectrum from, uh, on the one hand, having a very simple kind of power, Marx calls that that capitalists are character masks, right? They are just as unfree as the workers because they have to use their admittedly very large power in a way that is always profit maximizing because otherwise they'll be driven out of business, so to speak. So they don't have a lot of real uh, creative power. They just have power to suck up more capital. 
to become richer. And then at the other end of the spectrum, uh, you have the idea that they have tremendous power, creative power, and can really change our culture, uh, get us in a certain uh, direction and influence very strongly the kind of ideas that dominate and the structures, the uh, institutional structures that emerge in our countries. It's not a very clear question, but I hope you get the, the sense. What's uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, it's more of a commentary, I suppose, than a, than a question. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm probably gonna, gonna have to go now because okay. my, I'm gonna get into trouble. Nicholas, <laughs> thank you so much, afraid. and in regards to your family. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, yeah. And uh, thank you, thank you so much. It's been really interesting talking thank to everyone. Thank you for and, coming. Terrific. Wonderful. We'll we'll post All this right. shortly. Thank you, Nick. Okay. Thanks. Right. Bye. Terrific. Bye. Well, thank you everybody for a, a great session. I think um, you know I originally started out as an antitrust lawyer. I think I lasted at that about six months <laughs> on Wall Street and uh, went off to other things. But um, uh, back in the late seventies, you had. Corporate power was a mere shadow of its current uh, uh, form. But if you go back to 1816, when Massachusetts started chartering uh, companies, you had term limits on the charters. You had the renewal of the corporate charters being uh, uh, conditioned on public benefits being supplied by the corporations. Uh, you had uh, the state actually uh, using corporations for specific purposes. And so it wasn't until 1896 in New Jersey when they had open-ended corporate charters that could be designed by the private owners of the corporations themselves. And between, in that one century, you had a tremendous growth of corporate rights. In this period, we've seen an explosion of corporate rights, rights that even private citizens don't have uh, to campaign contributions, anonymity, uh, eternal life, the, the, the power to reproduce all over the globe. So this is in many ways, I think this concentration of corporate power is in many ways the issue for our time because it stands behind every single other problem that we're talking about here. Um, and it's something that we have to grapple with.